and welcome to the lecture accompanying chapter two, Observing the Sky. In this chapter, we're going to talk about how we can make up observations here, from, here on Earth that help explain our place in the solar system, the phenomenon based around the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, things like the tilt of the Earth, the movement of the constellations relative to Earth, and so on. Okay, so there's going to both be an idea of ancient astronomy and how we can imagine that these are observations we can make ourselves by just looking up at the sky. All right. <clears throat> so the night sky is composed of millions of stars that we can see. All of the individual stars that we are seeing are within our own galaxy. No other galaxies are visible to the naked eye because they are too faint to see. Okay? The Andromeda galaxy would be as large in angular size as the moon, but too faint to be discerned with the naked eye. We need to be able to collect more light as you can do with a telescope or you could do with a digital device, but the eye is limited to how, how much light it is sensitive to. Right? Even this photo shown here is taken in, in such a way that the camera's sensor is left exposed to the ambient light of the sky for a long time, thus making the stars much brighter than they would appear to the naked eye and making fainter stars visible. Okay? There are things like nebula that are visible. We can see the streak of the Milky Way across the sky, like here. Okay? When you stand on Earth and you look up, look up into the sky, you see a point where the horizon meets the ground. Directly above you is called the zenith. Okay, so the zenith is directly above you. The horizon is, again, the point where the sky meets the ground. The actual distance to the horizon depends on how clear your surroundings are and also where you're standing relative to obstructions like hills or trees. Best case, it's going to be perhaps 20 miles to that horizon. So the horizon is close, okay, in terms of physical distance on the surface of Earth. But the sky that you're seeing is always half of the celestial sphere, a name we give to all of the stars that surround Earth. Because if you are on perfectly flat ground, then you're going to be able to see half of the stars that could be seen from Earth at that time. Someone on the exact opposite side of the planet, again, would have a relatively near horizon, but they would be able to see the other half of the stars that are available to see from Earth totaling 88 constellations. So each of you could see half of those 88 total constellations, which is just the way that we sort of piecemeal break up the sky into puzzle-like pieces that cover the entirety. More on that in a minute. Okay? So here's the idea of the celestial sphere. So here's Earth, okay? Earth has its own equator, of course, right? That runs along its midsection relative to its poles. Its poles are fixed on the axis of rotation that Earth spins on, okay? So Earth spins on a particular axis. Now you might hear about the magnetic North Pole that's not exactly at the same location as the axial North Pole. Here we care about the axial North Pole because that's going to determine what we see from our moving vantage point on the surface of Earth. Moving, of course, because Earth is rotating every 24 hours about its own axis, okay? And we're not worried about its orbit around the sun just yet. Here we have a person, right? Here's our, right? our stick figure standing on the surface of Earth. And when they look up, directly above them again is their zenith. And then they're going to be able to see half of the celestial sphere. Okay? All right? And so in this case where they're standing, they're going to see exactly this half, John, here, of the celestial sphere. All right? So it would be from this being the horizon point, another horizon point, and zenith directly above, okay? Now, that means that their zenith does not match up with the North Celestial Pole. Neither does their horizon point match up with the celestial equator. The only time that an observer on Earth would have a zenith that exactly matches up with the North Celestial Pole and a horizon that exactly matches up with the celestial equator is if that person was standing at the North Pole at the location of the Earth's rotational axis, okay? Because again, 
Zenith is a term that refers to your local sky, what you see from your vantage point. North Celestial Pole is a fixed point relative to the entire planet. All right, just as horizon is a local term, celestial equator is a fixed term that describes the entire planet. And it's worth noting that the celestial equator is a projection of the Earth's equator. In other words, it is directly above the Earth's equator. We could draw the connecting lines from the celestial equator right back down to Earth's equator, right? And it's a direct correlation. When you have a long exposure, like I mentioned, that allows you to collect more light and have more visible stars, you also often get the consequence, unless you have a moving camera during that long exposure, that the stars move while your camera is open and exposed to light. The result of that long exposure is often visible evidence of the Earth's rotation. All right, so here is a picture taken on, from the surface of Earth looking up at the sky where a camera has been left exposed to light for a period of time. And we see that all of these streaks appear to be moving stars, almost like the stars are racing across the sky. But of course, it's not the stars that are moving relative to Earth, it's Earth that's moving relative to the stars. Specifically, it's the surface of Earth that's moving relative to the stars because the surface of Earth is spinning, right, with that full rotation every 24 hours. That gives the perception of these spinning stars. And the reason these spinning stars appear to make concentric circles coming down to one point is that single point is none other than the North Celestial Pole. Because that is a fixed point that stars would not appear to move about because it's a fixed point relative to Earth's own rotation about its axis. So no stars would move at that point, okay? In the Northern Hemisphere, there's a star very close to the North Celestial Pole called Polaris or the North Star. That star thus does not appear to move over the duration of a single evening. All the other stars do. Stars that complete a complete circle and never dip above the horizon are called circumpolar stars. Stars that do dip beneath the horizon are not called circumpolar stars, okay? They're just normal stars, okay? So again, this, this picture then has another implied piece of information. It tells us that this observer, also probably based on the fact that there's trees and not snow everywhere, but this observer is not located at the North Pole because if they were located at the North Pole, this fixed point would be directly overhead. It'd be their zenith, and clearly it's not. It's a few degrees above the horizon, okay? So a lot of information there. All right, so continuing with the idea about how the zenith can correspond to different points. This is elaborating on the ideas I've talked about. So if you are an observer at the North Pole, then your zenith exactly matches with the North Celestial Pole. If you are an observer standing at the equator, then your zenith actually matches up with the, um, let's see, in this case, at the equator, okay? So if you're standing, if you're, I'm just uh, checking observers here, yeah. So if you're standing at the equator, then your zenith is, well, just your zenith. But then the interesting thing is then your horizon becomes the North Celestial Pole, see? So the North Celestial Pole is right at your local horizon. Or you can be somewhere in between, like we are, right? At some northern latitude, like in North America. And then your zenith is neither the North Celestial, because your zenith is right here, is neither the North Celestial Pole, nor is, your, nor is your zenith the celestial equator, right? It's just somewhere in between. But the interesting thing is if you measure the distance between your zenith and the North Celestial Pole, you can determine your latitude. You can, met, you can always determine your latitude at night. Think about how important that would be to ancient mariners, okay? They look up at the stars and they know their latitude. Maybe they know they've been blowing off course to the north or the south. Doesn't tell anything about east or west, but it does tell you if you're north or south of a point and you can know exactly where you're located based on the location of your zenith relative to the North Celestial Pole. And how do you find the North Celestial Pole? Well, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's easy. You just find Polaris. In the southern hemisphere, you might want to do a long exposure and look for the circumpolar stars and the concentric circles and thus ascertain where that fixed point is. So moving on to the idea of constellations in the ecliptic. So we, talk, we talked about this idea of the local, local sky and the celestial sphere. Well, 
when you look up at your local sky, the, the sun will move through it because, of course, the earth is rotating, thus the sun appears to be moving. Again, the sun is not moving, the earth is spinning about its own axis, causing the sun to appear to, appear to rise and set every night, just as things like the, the, the stars appear to rise and set every, every night. Um, I'll mention the moon in just a second, and it's a appeared, appeared motion as well, or it's apparent motion. But then how does this correspond to the idea of the ecliptic? Well, if we look at the celestial sphere, we find out that the ecliptic is a line, let me show you here, a line that neither matches with the celestial equator nor passes through the celestial poles. If I was to draw it on this diagram here, it would look something like this. So it would be another circle, right, that overlays on the sphere. Okay, so here's this, the whole sphere. And just as the equator is a circle that wraps around that sphere, this second red line that I drew is a circle that wraps around the sphere, the sphere being the celestial sphere. But what is this tilted second circle I drew that's kind of off, offset from the celestial equator? Again, the celestial equator is being a projection of the Earth's equator. Well, it's none other than the ecliptic. Okay? And what the ecliptic is, and we'll talk about it when I go back to this, the next slide in just a moment, the ecliptic is the path of the sun through the celestial sphere. Again, it's not actually moving. This is just apparent motion. And the reason that the ecliptic does not match up with the celestial equator is because the earth is tilted. We are tilted 24 and a half degrees. Thus, we have seasons and the ecliptic does not match up with the celestial sphere. Okay? Now, why might we care about the ecliptic? Well, the ecliptic for ancient astronomers was very important and all of the groups of stars called constellations and that matched up with certain figures and animals that lay along that line were given special deference and special names and they became what we know as the zodiac. So these are just the constellations that lie in a circuit, circle along the ecliptic. Okay? And they are, of course, Virgo, Leo, Cancer, Gemini, Taurus, Aries, Pisces, Aquarius, Capricornus, Sagittarius, o Ophucus, that one's tough, Scorpius, and Libra, okay? So these are the constellations that are along the ecliptic. And when we think about the zodiac and the months they correspond to and what someone's zodiac sign might be, that is actually the constellation that is on the other side of the sun at that time of year. So you actually can never, if, say for example, right, we have August, and we know that August is going to, uh, to match up with, um, with Leo and Cancer, kind of depending on what part of August you're in, then you actually don't see Leo at night. That constellation will be completely hidden by the sun. Because constellations that are on the other side of the sun, well, they would only be visible during the day, thus we can't see them right? Because the sun is so bright, it obscures stars during the day. We can only see stars when we're on the surface of the earth turned away from the sun. And so that means that in August, you would see Sagittarius Capricornus at night, and you wouldn't see Leo or Cancer or Gemini during the day. But yet that time of the month is associated with the hidden constellation because it is being blessed, so to speak, by the sun. So you could see kind of the spiritual significance in ancient times of the constellation that is one with the sun that time of year. Okay, so that's kind of the idea behind constellations. Important thing to remember, they lie along the ecliptic. Okay, so here we have it, right? Here's our tilted ecliptic. This being, this tilt here, this angle, it corresponds to the tilt of the earth, okay? That's the tilt angle of the earth, 23 and a half degrees. All right. And again, that 23 and a half degrees is so important because it means that the sun hits more directly and, and either the northern or, summer northern or um, southern hemisphere during either winter or summer. That's why we have seasons. And that's why the seasons are flip-flopped, that our winter in the northern hemisphere corresponds to summer, summer in the southern hemisphere. Okay. Okay. So here is an example of a constellation, Orion the Hunter, okay, kind of the pictorial representation, the stars you can actually see, Orion being a great one because those three stars are so visible. Go, um, go back and uh, refer to the previous slide so you know what time of the year you might see Orion, 
and um, well, I guess Orion isn't on the ecliptic, but you can still think about its proximity to something like Gemini and what time of the year you might see it. Now let's talk a bit about shadows, okay? So this slide is meant to represent one thing that Earth has around shadow, and that is evidenced by the fact that when you look at lunar eclipses and Earth's shadow passes over the moon, we can actually see its rounding here, right? We can see that the shadow is not, say, rectangular, right? Earth is not flat, it's not disc-shaped. We can clearly see that Earth must be a spherical object because of the way it casts a shadow on the moon, okay? And it points out that even ancient astronomers took this as evidence of a spherical Earth. Take note of that, okay? But what's also important about this slide is we're seeing a lunar eclipse. And I want to speak briefly about the idea of eclipses and light and how we can make sense of both solar eclipses and lunar eclipses. So let me pull up another image for you. All right. So, excuse me. In this extra image, I wanted to show the sun and earth and the moon during both a solar eclipse shown in the top and a lunar eclipse shown in the bottom. So a solar eclipse is when the moon gets between us and the sun and the moon shadow is cast on the surface of earth. A lunar eclipse is where Earth gets between the Sun and the Moon, and the Moon is in Earth's shadow. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, a couple of things. A solar eclipse is very local. We can see that it, the path of totality is a small dark circle that only covers a couple hundred miles. In this case, you can see it over Africa. Okay? There is a larger circle, which is a partial eclipse, like the one that passed over Northern California um, in the last um, great American solar eclipse, okay? So that's the idea. Small dark shadow that races over Earth at the speed that the moon orbits us, which is about one kilometer per second, and a larger, fainter shadow that has partial solar eclipse. The only, the only part where you can actually see, say, the stars in the middle of the day is if you are in the smaller, darker section, which is called the path of totality, okay? Now, the idea, those terms, are umbra and penumbra that you see kind of at the top of the page. The umbra is the dark central sh shadow, and the penumbra is the fainter outer shadow where the partial eclipse occurs. Okay, well, then when the moon passes through the Earth's umbra, that is a total lunar eclipse. When the Earth is in the, um, the when the moon, excuse me, is in the Earth's umbra, then the moon, you might think, well, if it's behind us, doesn't it appear dark? But it doesn't. Lunar eclipses always correspond to a red moon, and that's because the light that is reflecting off of the edges of the Earth is the same type of, type of light you see at sunset. That is red light. That is the long wavelength light that is, that is not being scattered by our atmosphere and able to pass through our atmosphere. That light, since it passes through our atmosphere, is the only light that, it, that is then going to be reflected off the surface of the moon, thus making the moon appear red during a total lunar eclipse when the moon is behind us relative to the sun, okay? Now, important thing about the eclipses is lunar eclipses are more common and they only need to have the moon pass through Earth's shadow. The size of the moon doesn't matter other than that the moon can't be so large that it doesn't fit in Earth's umbra, but clearly we can see that the umbra is actually much larger than the lunar eclipse. It also means lunar eclipse lasts longer. Now, solar eclipses are much more remarkable because solar eclipses are only possible, especially in the particular way we see them, where the moon covers the sun exactly, leaving the corona, in other words, the atmosphere of the sun visible, because the sun and the moon have the same angular size, which is just an amazing coincidence. Okay, so let's move on with the things that we can see in the sky and observing the sky, and we'll get to a bit of history to wrap up this lecture. All right, so this is the idea about how, how we can kind of make assumptions about light because when we talk about the light coming from the sun, like we were talking about in, in the image that I showed you, the extra image, we make this assumption that the light coming from the sun is coming at us in straight lines. And the reason we can do that is because the reason we can do that is because the distance is so great. Unlike when you hold a lamp close to a wall and you only get one spot and you can kind of see the light clearly coming out at angles, well, this, that's not the case with the sun. It's so far away that the light is, a, is a, effectively coming in in a straight path. Parallel rays, we call it. Now, 
We're going to get into history a bit, but let's get into ancient history first. And this is an amazing experiment about that showed that, that ancient scientists and astronomers, and which were also called philosophers at this time, this was over 2,000 years ago, that they knew that the Earth was round. First of all, they speculated it was based on the, the during lunar eclipses and that obvious round shadow of Earth. But there was a particularly famous experiment by the philosopher and scientist of Rasthenes. And what Erastenes, there we are, what Erastenes did is he did a measurement at two separate cities, a known distance apart in the ancient world, and did observations at those two, two separate cities. In Alexandria, he had a tall pole shown here. All right? And that tall pole cast a shadow, and the length of that shadow gave him a particular angle. Okay? So you have the angle of the shadow. Meanwhile, on that same day, in Syene, 4,400 stadia to the south, and a stadia corresponds to a particular distance um, based on records that we have um, that have survived from that time. So a known distance to the south in another famous city, not as well known as Alexandria, but a famous merchant city of the time, he had, instead of a tower, he had a well. Because while the rays of the sun were coming down and hitting the tower at an angle, they were hitting the well directly. So he was able to confirm that by seeing the glint of the light from the bottom of the well. Thus he knew that the angle that corresponded to the length of the shadow relative to the height of the column or pole had to equal the angle between Syene and Alexandria on the curved surface of the earth. And since he knew, since he knew that this wedge had an arc length, which is the mathematical term, of 4,400 stadia, which you could convert to kilograms today, he then was able to calculate with the angle and the arc length the entire circumference of the Earth. Okay, So not only did it confirm, which he was assumed at the time that the Earth was a sphere, but he had a, actually a very accurate measurement of the circumference of the Earth and thus the radius of the Earth because the um, mathematicians knew that you could divide the circumference by 2 pi in order to get the radius. Remarkable, right? But a lot of this knowledge was lost. A lot of it, a lot of it was dispelled and discouraged and other ideas became prevalent in centuries to come. All right. So the earth processes as, as it rotates. All right. It process, processes through space. This is a very, very slow process. It takes 20, 26,000 years. This means that the constellations don't stay fixed. The constellations that we see today will not be the constellations in many thousands of years. Okay? One consequence of our motion, our orbit relative to other orbits in space is that when we catch up with planets like Mars that are moving more slowly around the sun than us, we, and we overtake that slower moving planet, and again, Mars is moving slower because it's further away from the sun than us, and the further you are, the slower your orbit. So when Earth catches up with Mars and it overtakes it, Mars appears to move backwards in the, st in the sky, not over a single night, but over many nights. And that is called apparent retrograde motion, and is explained exactly by the, by the idea that Earth is catching up and passing Mars in our respective orbits. Okay? But that idea wasn't understood by ancient astronomers because Earth was not thought to move. How could Earth be moving? So instead, apparent retrograde motion was explained by the idea that planets didn't just orbit Earth, but they also had these things called epicycles, small orbits upon orbits, almost like gears on gears. Of course, this is not true. This is not the way it works because what would be the physics to explain that? But this was the best explanation they had over 2,000 years ago. So that although they got some things right, like the, the roundness of the Earth, the spherical nature of the Earth, they didn't quite understand that Earth was not the center of the universe. And this, was, this, this idea of epicenters was proposed by a famous philosopher and scientist called Ptolemy from, from around 2,000 years ago. All right? And in fact, it wasn't until the, the Renaissance and the revival of the idea about, of course, Earth being a sphere, you know, and that you could move around it, but also the idea that Earth wasn't the center of the universe. And we had what's called the Copernican Revolution that said that, no, the, cent the sun was the center, at least, of our solar system, which was the known universe at the time. And that meant that there had to be consequences. And one of the big consequences of the sun being the center of our solar system was that Venus had phases. 
and the phases of Venus were shown by the famous astronomer Galileo. He was able to observe with his telescope, which was a crucial innovation because it wasn't visible with the naked eye, but using some of the first telescopes, then his wasn't the very first, but one of the, one of the first telescopes, he was able to show that Venus went through phases, and Venus only is able to go through phases if it's between us and the sun. And if Venus is between us and the sun, well, maybe they're both orbiting us, but only if Venus goes behind the sun some of the time. Well, in that case, if Venus goes behind the sun, then Venus must orbit the sun. And that means that we must also orbit the sun. And this meant that the Copernican philosophy, the Copernican revolution, as it's called, was experimentally confirmed and observed by Galileo. And this set the groundwork for modern astronomy. And the mathematical language that then was created the generation after Galileo by Newton, that then we can really say led to modern science, including modern astronomy. Okay? So hopefully this idea about looking at the sky, understanding the celestial sphere, things like the ecliptic and constellations, and a little bit of history has given you a good idea about, about what chapter two is all about. Thank you so much for watching this video.